Hello, everyone, and, and welcome back to our lecture series sponsored by the Department of Africana Studies at Georgia State University, uh, and of course, our phenomenal partners, the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American history and culture. And it is my pleasure to introduce someone that we all in the department know very well. Um, she is a graduate of our department on the master's level and just a, a ongoing citizen of our department and makes contributions in a number of different ways, including as a teacher. And before I, I do the formal introduction, I will share a story. Uh, she was teaching a class, I, I can't remember, I think as an adjunct instructor, and I'm very much invested in undergraduate education. I love teaching. And she invited me to come to her class and do a guest lecture. And before I entered, she said to me, now just, just wait, just wait a minute. I just, just watch this. Just tell me, we're walking into class. I walked into class with her and the class erupted in applause, not for the you know, full professor, the visiting lecturer, but for Professor, now Professor Gibson, who I understand is now being referred to as Dr. G, which is my name, and somehow she has taken it upon herself to steal it. So we will address that uh, later offline, but we are very, very excited to have uh, Professor Gibson here. She is she is a, uh, a graduate that always makes us proud and represents the highest aspirations of our program. She is currently an assistant professor in the Department of African American Studies at Virginia Commonwealth in Richmond. She describes herself as a Black future feminist pop culture scholar. Her areas of research centers on Black popular culture, digital humanities, representations of race and gender within comic books, Afrofuturism, uh, and race and new media. Her work has been featured in various publications and book chapters through such out outlets as Huffington Post, Chicago's Humanities Festival, NPR.org, Black Perspectives, uh, as well as many others, including many other lectures across the nation and, and beyond. Her current book project seeks to explore Black female identities as personified in comics and fandom culture. Outside of the classroom, you can find Dr. G, collecting comic books and stamps on her international travel discoveries, ticket stubs to the latest movies, co-hosting the video podcast, conversations with Beloved and Kindred, participating as part of the Black Comics Chat podcast, and giving back to the community through a myriad of projects and organizations. You can also follow her via blackfuturefeminist.com and on Twitter at gbreezy20. And so, Tonight, we're fortunate enough to have her participating in our, our Freedom School lecture series that has been crafted and curated by our, our great friend and colleague who's worked so hard on this, Lakita Bennett Bailey. And her title this evening is Making Our Stories Visible, Humanizing the Black Experience Through Television. Professor Gibson, Dr. G, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Um... Thank you for this opportunity to participate in this awesome series. Uh, definitely want to give a special thank you to um, both Dr. Makita Burnett Bailey and Dr. Dr. Jonathan Gales. Um, this opportunity is in a way kind of me returning the service and giving back to a community who has and continues to have a huge impact on who I am um, as a scholar. So I also want to thank my students at VCU who always keep me on my toes um, on everything that's current and everything that's happening. And um, to uh, a huge shout out to my mom who always, um, she allowed me to watch TV long days and you know hours and all that, even when I said, just give me 10 more minutes. So um, this is a huge shout out to um, her as well. So let's get started. So yes, Freedom School, Back to School, Making Our Stories Visible, Humanizing the Black Experience Through Television. And so uh, where do we start? So a little bit of background. So who I am, as mentioned in the bio, 
I'm an assistant professor in African American studies. Um, I'm what I like to call myself a consumer and producer of pop culture, and you know, very much a, a scholar in that. Um, a black girl nerd, a huge major comic book fan, and someone who was able to turn a hobby into a profession. Um, never did I think that I would be able to to do that, but you know, here I am. And so to be able to talk about one of the things that I have loved and continue to love television um, is, you know, something huge for me. And so like I said, pop culture is something that I live and breathe um, on several occasions. I even have to tell myself, just watching it in fun. Don't analyze, just watch in fun, so. All righty, so in the beginning, so I want to take a little bit of a, you know, a, a couple of seconds, you know, to talk about um, the history of Blackness in television, because we kind of need to have that background um, before we dive into the, um, the three series that we're going to look at today. So television, you know, comes largely out um, in the 1940s, you know, during the wartime. And it was largely this kind of space of a, you know, coordinated America. And in many ways, people view themselves or saw themselves as citizens um, within this framework of the television. So the first Black sitcom that we would see originated from a radio program, which would be Amos and Andy, um, in which, in this case, it was two white men portraying the characters. Um, later, it would be adapted to television. And it would be, quote, it was the first show to have an all-Black cast to talk about the black community, but it was very much still othered. And so um, television serves in many ways as this form, a visual form of escapism, entertainment, education, news, gossip, and advertisement. Um, and as this popular medium, it holds a, a significant power as it plays a role in influencing viewers' attitudes and beliefs about ourselves as well as other cultural backgrounds. And so we all know, and even just looking at the various images here of several um, uh, television shows featuring um, black, care, black cast, black families, uh, black stories, um, there's always been stories that we have been telling uh, about the black experience uh, through television. But there have been some pertinent questions of who gets to tell them and how are they um, being told is what is, um, it is definitely even more important. And so we begin to see like in the 1970s where uh, shows like The Jeffersons, Sanford and Son, Good Times and What's Happening um, are carrying, you know, showing um, black families, they're showing uh, different neighborhoods, they're looking at various locations, they're talking about socioeconomic issues, but they're also um, incorporating and carrying over lingering stereotypes about African-American families um, and not necessarily always in the best light. Um, and so then we would see in the 80s, we would see um, <clears throat> The Cosby Show, A Different World, Reading Rainbow, Soul Train, 227, Different Strokes, Amen, um, Family Matters, and Frank's Place would be many of the shows that would kind of see the shift um, in the 80s. And then the 90s, we would see a centering around hip hop and black popular culture with shows like The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, in Living Color, Martin, and Living Single. And as someone who grew up in the 90s, many of those shows exemplify, to me, expressions of aspiration, motivation, and were uh, presented a very familiar reality. And um, I'm, I'm one to say, I've always um, wanted to see many stories of Black folks being told and not the same ones being recycled. And so many of these shows definitely, and if not all of them, um, allow for that to be uh, the case. <clears throat> And so throughout each decade, you know, Black representation has gone through many shifts and changes, but still, like I said, there's a few things in question that we still have to consider. So what are those? So these shows in question here. So if we fast forward to the 2020s, we're definitely seeing an increase in representation on the screen of Black folks and Black experiences. Um, and it was just as important to have that same representation behind the camera as well. Um, so we're seeing more television shows showing complex, nuanced, and diverse uh, Black experiences. And so essentially, um, these particular shows, um, for sure, and many others, have um, done this reemergence of Black storytelling. And so um, we're seeing a, uh, this growing cadre of Black talent and stories being told 
And there are also specific stories that are uh, being told and worth highlighting. So you may ask, you know, Dr. Grace, like, why, you know, why are we looking at these particular shows? So there's a little bit of bias. So these are three shows that I'm huge fans of. Um, these are also shows that offer uh, different genres. So looking at the Black experience from various um, television genres. And they're also very um, controversial. Um, and this is not saying it in a bad way, but controversial in that it's drawing and, and getting a lot of attention because of that. Um, and also uh, the fact that they have storylines that just grab you and that are intriguing and like I said, um, definitely worth highlighting. And we haven't seen either in a long time or not at all. And so first, uh, so as you see here, the shows in question for this evening are HBO's Lovecraft Country, HBO's A Black Lady Sketch Show, and Star's P Valley. So let's start with HBO's Lovecraft Country. So August 16th, 2020, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. At this specific moment, I was continuing the celebration of my 39th birthday, but I was also preparing for the premiere of HBO's new series, Lovecraft Country, developed by Misha Green. So based on the 2016 book of the same name and described as an American horror drama series, I had been hooked just based on the trailer and the cast alone. Um, Lovecraft Country would incorporate the genre of horror um, and would be seen in a regular conversation amongst uh, many of my family and friends. And after this series, um, there would be the many ways that I would see how uh, this show um, offered a creative reflection. Um, even though it is taking place in the 1950s, it's definitely reflecting upon what is happening um, in the current day. And so continuing in the same vein as such shows as Watchmen, uh, such show as Watchmen, Lovecraft Country literally rewrites the dangerous, horrific script tales of writer H.P. Lovecraft, and in a way is reclaiming the narrative. And so as noted by horror scholar Robin Means Coleman, the genre of horror should offer representational space for Black people to challenge the more negative or racist images seen in other media outlets and to portray greater diversity within the concept of Blackness itself. And Lovecraft Country does just that by moving away from the passive voice um, and centering all of the Black narratives and reclaiming the Black body from past traumas, both in fiction and reality for a better future. Um, we see this ontological approach to the Black experience where in every episode is like a roller coaster ride, not knowing what's gonna take, you know, when we're gonna take a turn, not when we know we're gonna take a deep dive. And it, you know, in ways sometimes cuts you to the core um, where there are many moments that you want to cry or even close your eyes, but you still peek through. Uh, Lovecraft Country has become bigger than the series itself. It has been able to translate into discussions of educational practices, black women and girl empowerment, and the trials of joys and the, the trials and joys of traveling while black. Um, and it becomes another platform for social and political commentary. And so a few uh, themes that I definitely wanted to point out to address here is that um, with Lovecraft Country, one of the important things that stood out to me and what would also um, be the significant in this case with P-Valley as well is the location. And so um, we are able to see the experience from a black, a black Midwestern experience, particularly in Chicago, Illinois. Um, it's not often that we are able to see uh, Chicago highlighted, um, oftentimes Los Angeles, um, New York, I would even inc uh, incorporate Atlanta and Miami have become these major hub cities. So we're getting this opportunity to see Chicago um, in the 1950s from this particular black point of view. And so um, we're also able to see the significance of blending horror, science fiction and historical fiction. Horror and science fiction in particular are genres where we're not often seeing the Black experience being told. Um, in some cases, some would say that Black people don't exist in space or they don't ex exist in science fiction. And so why would we include them in a storyline of such? Um, also with horror, there's always the stereotype of, so when we gonna die? Are we dying first? Are we dying, you know, are we dying last? So when do we die? Do we get to live? 
Um, and how bad is the death? Not even in the existence of life uh, do we see within the horror genre. And so, and then historical fiction, not in the sense of just um, it typically enslavement, but we're seeing um, what's going on in, as far as traveling, we're seeing things that are related to like the Green Book. We're seeing this idea of, of joy, we're seeing um, passion, we're seeing um, socioeconomic status of those who are making um, great wages and who are actually doing more than just surviving, but actually thriving. Um, we're also, as mentioned, centering the Black narrative and, you know, this reclamation of past traumas. Um, through this, we're also seeing Black queer visibility and varying degrees of Black masculinity. This is seen uh, particularly through the character of Montrose uh, Freeman, uh, who is played by the late actor Michael K. Williams. Um, and we're also seeing varying degrees of Black masculinity, not just from Montrose, but also from George and from um, Atticus. And so we're seeing the ways in which these, this father, son, and uncle are able to show us that Black masculinity is not monolithic and that we do see um, the struggles, the joys, the triumphs uh, from that. And so um, looking particularly though at Black queer visibility, um, this is something we're seeing in the 1950s. And so we, we, it's very rare that we're even having that conversation, let alone even seeing it be played out um, not just in a one moment, but in several episode, episodes do we see that. We see uh, Black spirituality also being showcased. Um, if, you, um, if many of you all have seen, you know, um, the episode in which they're channeling the ancestors. Um, so we're seeing lots of different ways in which spirituality is not commodified in a way of, um, of seeing as this, this bad thing, but it's actually a way of appreciating um, what Black spirituality has uh, to offer. We're also seeing Black girlhood um, and this idea of Black women uninterrupted or interrupted. Um, and we're seeing um, this importance of that and how Black women have a voice and Black girls have a voice and that they're not relying on someone else to tell their story. Um, this is uh, particularly seen through the character of Dee and Hippolyta and where they are making their stance known that I am here, that I exist, um, and that um, there may have been moments where you were, um, I was in your shadow, but no, no longer um, am I in that. And so um, we're also seeing um, the opportunity of the timing being very uh, noteworthy. Um, every week we watched a new episode where, and at the same time, the world was tackling and experiencing the real life inescapable horrors protests were happening and it was there were many movements of justice and equality that were taking place simultaneously. And even as we were living and experiencing many of these real life horrors, we were we had an opportunity to rewrite the scripts of that history in real time. And so this show in many ways uh, made me really think about a thought from Bell Hooks in Loving Blackness as political resistance. And this thought of the struggle between loving oneself and still wishing for a well-earned break from society's ills. Next, we'll take a look uh, and offer some humor in HBO's A Black Lady Sketch Show. And so here we're seeing uh, this opportunity to uh, look at Black women in the comedy genre um, and in a large format form. And it's not just one particular single character um, do we have to, um, that, we, that we get to look at, we're get, looking at a large collective of Black women. And so if we look at, take a back um, to the history of Black women in comedy, one name that always would definitely come up is that of Moms Mabley, who is a pioneer of uh, social satire and what it means to be unapologetic. And it would be, it wouldn't be decades before we began to even see a consistent or more regular appearance of Black women comedians in any type of role of stand-up, solo, or supporting uh, role. Um, in the 80s, we would see Marsha Warfield, Ellen Cleghorn, Deborah Wilson, and uh, Whoopi Goldberg, and Marie Johnson, uh, and Kim Wayans. And then definitely the 2000s, we see um, a consistent um, look of, and a consistent showing of Black women in, um, in comedy. And so achieving success in comedy has always been, uh, it's tough for, for many people, but particularly um, those who were not white men. And so while there were opportunities were increasing for black men 
and white women in comedy, black women were still continuing uh, to struggle. And so while there has been a steady flow and presence of black women in comedy, the last 10 years we have seen a burst of black female comedians, not just on screen, but creating and writing. And a black lady sketch show becomes an example of a show created by black women, written by black women and showcasing an all black women writing team. And so um, a series described as a limitless magical reality full of dynamic, hilarious characters and celebrity guests. A black lady sketch show touches on cult culturally re relevant themes such as social norms, anxiety, religion, sex, dating, and relationship. Um, in this first, first type of sketch show with an all black female cast and writer's room, we're seeing where black women comedians are finding a space and finding a space of belonging. There is um, this idea of being able to laugh at oneself, but also to talk about, you know, offer some commentary on what's going on um, in society as it relates particularly um, with black women and even laughing um, at others. We're seeing um, breaking ground in sketch comedy from this black female perspective. Um, Robin Thede, who is uh, one of the creators of a black lady sketch show would say, I want to show that black women are funny, but we aren't just one type of funny. It's about showing the, the diversity amongst black women. And so um, here, um, Robin Thede also would mention the great thing about it is, is I know so many different black women in comedy that I had my choice when it came to casting and writing the show. It was just an embarrassment of riches and the lie that we are not out here and not ready and prepared continues to be perpetuated. And yet she is able to dismantle this myth uh, for two, season, two seasons and on its way for a third. And so um, what I appreciated about a Black Lady Sketch Show is the intentionality of diverse Black female casting and that we're not just seeing one type of Black woman. We're seeing full figure Black women. We're seeing different skin types. We're seeing those who are identifying um, and, uh, their sexuality in different um, ways. And we're also moving away from seeing as though they have to fit into a particular uh, white male standard. And so um, it, um, additionally, one thing that also struck out to me is there is the storyline that has been running for a couple of seasons about this last, I, this idea of the last people on earth and it being a black woman and how that is significant in that the last person on earth is a black woman who's going to be, you know, the last one standing and how often black women are either taken away first or there is a struggle to, to maintain or there is an argument as to why she should even be existing um, in the first place. And so we're um, seeing a, a offering of a flavor uh, to this bland white standard through a black lady sketch show. Um, black women are no longer waiting for the SNL opportunity, but creating their own lanes and platforms. They are the change agents and they are offering the honest conversations. And so through by centralizing the black female voice in comedy, it's also rejecting, rejecting, excuse me, rejecting the lingering um, white male domination within the comedy field. And so when I think about a black lady sketch show for me, in a way it's creating a legacy of sisterhood of black female comedians. And in some ways kind of could be likened to a television version of the Kambahi River Collective via this uh, comedic lens. And last, there is Stars P Valley. Premiering in 2020 and described by uh, the network as down deep in the Mississippi Delta lies an oasis of grit and glitter and a rough patch of human existence where beauty can be hard to find, end quote. Uh, based on the play penned by showrunner and Pulitzer Prize winner Katori Hall, Pea Valley has taken us into this fictional Mississippi Delta small town of Chuckalisa, and where Hall notes, she actually um, um, grew up going to strip clubs. So it was just a part of the Southern culture, Southern Black culture. It was something that we didn't necessarily look at in a shameful way. And oftentimes the world is misunderstood and these women are misrepresented they are not respected. And I really wanted to put some respect on their name because I know that they're doing, what they're doing is art. It's nothing to be ashamed of. And so Pea Valley 
is highlighting uh, not only the characters of the, um, of the strip called, called The Pink, or as they would call it, The Pink. Um, it is also a series that is, one would say, an intersectional dream come true. Um, each episode, viewers are privy to The Pink, a strip club run by the savvy and brazen, um, but yet struggling business owner, Uncle Clifford, which you can see here um, in uh, the center. And so uh, with P Valley, we're seeing the conversation is moving away from strippers being judged and seen as these broken women and one dimensional and even second class, but as business women who have, uh, who have the hustle, who have the grind, who also have a vision. And so some things that we would see uh, from here, ooh, sorry about that. Um, we, some key themes that we would uh, see in P Valley is uh, this idea of location. So um, a thing that always strikes me, like I said, with particularly with Lovecraft Country is this idea of the Mississippi Delta. Um, just think about how often do we even hear the conversation of Mississippi come up? And when we do hear the conversation of Mississippi, what are we, what are we thinking of? What are some of the places that are coming to mind? Um, and definitely, although this is a fictional city, we probably definitely would not have heard of Chuck Elisa. It would not have been something that um, came on our radar. So having the opportunity to focus on a town that would not probably get any attention, um, whether intentionally or not, is uh, this opportunity to see uh, Chuck Elisa as a character in Pea Valley and not just simply the city in the setting of where it's taking place. Um, we're also seeing that there is diversity in the South, particularly as it relates to Blackness, um, and that uh, we can focus in on this one strip club for a period of eight episodes, and a lot can happen in these, uh, in these eight episodes. And so we're seeing how the women in this series are either aware or uh, will become aware of how they're able to capitalize on who they are um, as um, as uh, strippers, as dancers, however they are wanting to be um, labeled. And so we're able to see it, this deep dive, as one could say, into um, to the culture. There's also definitely debates over black sexuality, prop uh, propriety and sex work, and this idea of labor. Um, we're also seeing complicated family dynamics, whether it's balancing motherhood. One of um, the performers is has a newborn child or almost very you know close to being um, it's an infant that she has to bring with her on many occasions and have um, many of her coworkers watch the baby while she has to perform. We also see constrained mother-daughter relationships in, in many cases where it leads them both into uh, behind prison doors. We see the complication of the black church. Um, we're also seeing how uh, the role of colorism uh, plays in the hierarchy among not just the employees of the paint, but also some of the other characters, some of the business owners who are trying to shut down um, the paint. We see sexuality and submission as a weapon, whether it is to get what they want or as a defense tool. Um, we're seeing an amplifying and giving voice to the LGBTQ plus community. This is particularly seen in the character of Uncle Clifford, who uses the she and her pronouns who is very, is unforgettable, unapologetic, bold, and queer. Uh, Nico Anna, who plays Uncle Clifford, would explain how um, I wanted her to be reachable and for people to understand, oh, she's not a drag queen. Oh, she's not trans, you know? And explore what gender fluidity looks like or could look like. There's also a lot of vulnerability that we're seeing um, in, in the, the show, particularly also from with Uncle Clifford as he is navigating a relationship that uh, she is wanting to see, do I make this public or do I still hide behind because of what others may view me as or see me as? Um, and this is the relationship that she has um, with local rap artist, Little Murder. And so um, we're seeing an ability to see non-binary characters without it also being forced, without it being kind of just this side option. It is something that you are regularly uh, coming into contact with. Uh, P Valley has also been seen somewhat as a voyeuristic fantasy. Um, it makes me think about what scholar and author Tracy McMillan Cotton's essay, When Your Brown Body is a White Wonderland. And she writes, 
When I moved to Atlanta, I was made aware of a peculiar pastime of the city's white frat um, boy elite. They apparently enjoy getting drunk and visiting one of the city's many legendary black strip clubs rather than the white strip clubs. The fun part of this ritual seems to be rooted in the peculiarity of black female bodies, their athleticism and how hard um, they are willing to work for less money as opposed to the more white normative strippers who expect higher wages in exchange for just looking pretty naked. There are similar racialized patterns in um, the porn actress's pay, and as she suspects, a manner of sex and all manners of sex workers. The black strip clubs are a bargain good time because the value of black sexuality is discounted uh, relative to the acceptability of black women as a legitimate partner. And so P Valley definitely uh, tangles with what it means to talk about with respectability politics. It also um, offers an opportunity to talk about who gets to capitalize black women's bodies, who and also how, who gets to capitalize it. Um, we also, if we go back to the idea of location, being that uh, the depiction of the South is often privileged to certain locations, um, especially when it comes to the strip culture scene, um, often some people take the cues from Atlanta, but here we get to divert from that and see what uh, this life is like in Chuckalisa. We also see the legacies of enslavement are very apparent as far as land ownership and gentrification are taking place on a day-to-day -day basis in each of these episodes. And one thing that cannot forget is the labor of the artistry. Um, we are not all able, and one has to respect the balance, the core, quad, hamstring strength, and the navigating of the pole, the precision, and the rhythm. Um, and this offers us an opportunity to talk about this as an artistry and, some, and not something that is seen as second class. Um, and so P Valley offers the opportunity uh, to engage with climbing up the pole just to get out of the bottom. And some overall kind of closing thoughts to consider. I can't stress enough location, location, location. Um, also, um, one thing that would stand out um, with each of the shows was the musical soundtrack and how it was very fitting and how it, um, it is very um, streamlined in and how it just seemed to work. There was no question as far as why that particular song um, was done. And uh, this even goes back to P Valley's opening um, song, Down in the Valley. If you heard it, it is quite the catchy tune. Um, and each of these shows also speak to the strength, the trauma, the resiliency, the joy, the passion, and the tenacity and diversity of Black life, all in different ways, whether it's from the strip club, whether it's through comedy, or whether it's through horror and sci-fi. Um, one other thing that I also feel that should be noted is the way many of, most of these shows and all three of these are on premium cable networks. And so what does that say about other networks such as ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, and why they may not feature such content or um, consistently feature such content. Um, also, this diversity of storytelling and something that uh, Dr. Gales would teach, uh, would teach me when I took him in intro to Africana studies is that black life is not monolithic. Uh, and these shows, if nothing else, will definitely or definitely confirm that uh, for sure. And so in addition, like I said, there are many other shows and you know, only was able to talk about three today, but wanted to definitely make mention of other game changers uh, that are um, definitely speaking to the diverse storytelling with shows like The Shy, um, Blackish, Atlanta, uh, Black Lightning, I May Destroy You, Insecure, Pose, and Queen Sugar. And these are just a few. Um, as we know, there are many um, in which these have had a consistent running um, and so, which is why I call them game changers because they've had a long standing uh, following and that uh, many of them are still, you know, running even past five and six seasons. And so it shows you that people want to see these stories. People are wanting to hear about them. They want to know and they want to hear from these various uh, viewpoints of, of what the black experience can tell us. And then there's who's up next. And so we definitely are seeing um, a, a many of shows uh, such as 20s, uh, Run the World, um, Queens, um, a, a revamping of the Wonder Years. 
and um, and uh, other shows that are looking at the Black experience now from the uh, upper uh, echelon class of the Oak Bluffs. We're looking at it from Black women um, surviving and thriving in uh, Harlem, and then those who are kind of coming with their comeback careers, as well as looking at Black queer culture. And so there is a, um, a plethora of experiences for us to, to talk about as it relates to the Black experience, and there's no shortage of it. Uh, let's definitely be clear on that. So um, I am excited to see, you know, many of these shows um, I'm, I'm engaging and watching with our rating. Some of them, the new seasons are starting this week and in the following months. And so um, we, have, we don't have to worry about, um, do we have the material? Do we have the content? Um, and often we could even say that we're even creating the content. We're writing the content. Whereas um, if we look at some of the earlier shows in the 70s, we weren't behind the camera. We weren't right behind the script. And so um, we have the pen, we have the paper, we have the video camera to do that and to change that. And, uh, and we are doing that. And so I just wanna thank you all for this opportunity to um, take a little glance into talking about the black experience through television. Um, these are where you can find me on the socials and we can dive into the Q and A. Thank you, Dr. G. That was phenomenal, of course. And I'll share with the audience that Dr. G and I are, are nerds. We, we are proud Black nerds. Um, and we talk all things comic books and science fiction. And that was a phenomenal presentation. And I'm excited about the way in which you've expanded your own research to to include television. I won't brag about your dissertation research and especially your thesis research, but um, maybe we'll get a chance to come to that. And it's funny, so uh, Lisa Wynn Bryan poses a question and before I read her question, I wanted to ask you about Michael Burnham, your thoughts on Michael Burnham, um, played by Sonequa Martin Green. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I think, yeah, it was just they wrapped season three. And just, just to see how you thought, and I think it was an important point where you talked about premium premium channels and the way in which that might limit our access, you know, by extension. But where do you think a character like Michael Burnham in the, in the Star Trek um, universe um, fits in, in your analysis? So definitely to the, you know, debunk, debunking the theory that Black folks exist in space, you know, right off the bat, you know, um, and just the idea that this is a Black woman who is brilliantly smart, like genius smart, uh, and is very apologetic in the sense of like having folks question, you know, um, who, who um, she is. I'm a little behind, so I'm not all the way up to date, but... <laughs> Don't, don't get on me, don't get on me. But uh, there's so many shows to watch. So many shows. But um, just like generally speaking, then just the idea of her existence on the show, period. Uh, mm. So you know, just taking away the character itself, but just the existence of actually being in this regular long standing series that has uh, primarily been largely white and male. Um, it offers the opportunity to say like a black female voice is not just also, um, a sidekick, but a primary character um, and a centralized character who is commanding and demanding of, of respect. So um, definitely fits in the opportunity of being able to maybe even draw those into the sci-fi you know, genre who may not have even thought about um, wanting to get into it because there's a familiar face. And I think that's why it's you know, so important to have that representation um, because um, it, can, it changes the game in many ways. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. So Lisa Wynn Bryan asks the following, are there many Black women in acting roles of leadership in, in, in TV? And we talked about one, Michael Burnham. Uh, it is very rare to see a Black female actor playing the role of power like POTUS, a character that is not in distress or needing saving. Can you name a show where a Black woman is the lead? P.S. I'm very upset that Lovecraft is not returning. Yes, Lisa, that's one of my students. I, you know, thank you for that question. Shout out to, uh, to um, Lisa there. Um, one show in particular that always I come back to, and as long as it's still running and the season is going, that has multiple Black women 
uh, not just one, is that of Queen Sugar. Um, and because Queen Sugar offers the opportunity to see Black women from different angles, ages, uh, different experiences, uh, skin type, uh, sexuality, and in a lead role of power, whether it's power in um, the, uh, the corporate side or power on the side of community, local community. And so we get to see varying degrees of what power looks like because oftentimes power can be just seen as like Wall Street, uh, but power can also mean you are um, a university president, not just the professor, but the president, um, that you are leading a coalition um, that is allowing for vaccines and so forth to come into communities. Um, you are a, a city council member um, in a maybe an area that was not ever represented. And so Queen Sugar offers that um, as the characters and in the fact that uh, Ava DuVernay is very intentional about every director for each episode has to be a woman um, and is often a woman of color. So here there's an example of not just seen on the screen, but behind the camera as well, mm -hmm. seeing women in positions um, of power. And so we don't have to wait, you know, to be like, can I get permission? Can y'all add me to, I just want to be a part of it. Um, we're, we're seeing, you know, DuVernay is doing a, a, a great example of that. Um, and, and, you know, where she's not waiting on anyone to give her um, that permission uh, to do that. Well, thank you for that that answer. Um, and keep the keep the questions coming in. You know, I, I love Queen Sugar for any number of reasons. It's 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 gorgeous to watch. Just I mean, it, it's it's just a beautiful thing to watch. You know, I'm thinking about um, WandaVision and the the character of uh, Monica Rambo. Um, who is, has a number of different manifestations and narratives in, in the comic in comic books, uh, but very you know a very important, a very powerful character, and also a very important character. I wonder if we might think about her. I will ask you about her, but also just think about what's coming, right? So there are rumors, and I think you might have shared this with me. Rumors of Ironheart, who you mentioned, perhaps being in the next. Uh, Black Panther film, and perhaps Shuri will be the next Black Panther following the comic book. And I'm going to resist the urge to show my my copy of the you know that comic book that I have framed. So um, I want to you know perhaps we can think look forward a bit and you know about what might be coming down the road that you know things to which we should attend and things that you may want to see that you have not yet seen. And I'll just throw something out. I cannot believe that we don't have a storm movie yet. Um, I, I think that is, it's a crisis. Uh, you know, I think we should call the National Guard or something. So uh, I just, you know, in looking forward, you know, and with characters like Monica Rambeau, what are the implications? And you, you touched on some of that, but I wanted to, to, to go in that direction if, if, if we could. Yeah, and it is a crime that there is not a storm you know, a movie, I'm like, wow, like, you know, you had many opportunities, but that is a whole, that's a whole nother presentation um, right there. Definitely, you know, I'm glad that you brought up Monica Rambeau um, because many might would say, you know, but it was about WandaVision. But I said, but at the same time, like Monica Rambeau stood her ground in there and she was swallowed up in a sea of whiteness, but she somehow still was able to like rise above that. And when I say rise above, meaning like, she didn't just fall in the shadows. She didn't just disappear. Um, and as it relates to, you know, as a big comic book nerd, like I was excited to even see um, her presence regularly and that it wasn't just in one or two episodes that we got to see her, you know, all the way through. And then the fact that we'll get to see more of her in the new Captain Marvel film. And so, um, it's exciting that finally, you know, Storm is not also the only Black comic book mm -hmm. female character that we're talking about. You know, the fact that we are talking about Shuri, who actually has had quite a long history as well. Um, I hope the Dora Milaje got a little bit more screen time because clearly they proved a point, you know, in Black Panther. Um, definitely when, as it relates to Ironheart, um, in that case, I'm hopeful because it will bring in another generation 
of young girls to see that, you know, you can see the 16 year old girl who goes to MIT who is a science genius and who picks up the mantle uh, from Ironheart and even gets his his nod. He's like, yes, I'm, I'm you, yes, this I'm passing this on to you. And so, um, which, you know, has many domino, a domino effect into the STEM field. And so mm. it's not just even just the comic itself, but the, the ramification that it has in other things and how it impacts um, other genres as well too. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just hopeful that black, more black women will also be in action because uh, we do well in drama. Um, I would even say we do well in comedy, but um, I, I wanna see more action fighting. I wanna see, you know, more of that. And, and um, we are very much capable um, of it, but I don't think we're all often given a fair chance. And I think um, Nomi, I believe this, the, the character's name that will be in the new James Bond, mm -hmm. um, may be kind of like that match lit to show you that, you know, <laughs> we can hold our own uh, just as much as anyone else. And, and, you know, we can show our weakness, we can show our strength and, and not only think that weakness has to be, you know, a bad thing. I think that's the other thing that people um, will critique is that, oh, you know, the black woman is always seen this way, but guess what? We struggle. We do get angry. We do go through these things. And so I'm not gonna also apologize for that. I'm gonna show you that this is also um, a reality. It's when it becomes overdone is when it's um, problematic. Right, I, you know, it, it's funny you mentioned James Bond. I, I I glanced at it. I didn't read the whole thing, so I probably shouldn't bring it up, but I'm going to anyway. I, it was an interview with Daniel Craig, and he, the blurb was something like, he didn't believe that a, a black woman should be the next 007, not because he was opposed to it, but because he believed that such a an, an actor should have their own vehicle. Mm -hmm. And you know, you and I have talked and there've been a lot of conversations about the idea of Sam Wilson being Captain America, but is he really Captain America? You know, this idea as I've said before, wearing some, borrowing someone else's clothes. Mm -hmm. And and I wonder what your thoughts are uh, about that. I, you know, so we have this new 007 movie coming. We have this phenomenal black actor playing uh, another agent was a black woman but you know given your you know if, if you had an opportunity to to write another film would you have that character play 007 as a black woman or would you have a completely separate storyline character you know what I mean I wonder what your thoughts are about that so, you know, I'm, I'm ambitious. So, you know, why, why can't we have it both? Why can't we have it all? Why do we have to be limited to like, let me just do a spinoff for you. You know, why can't I be in this spinoff and I can be in here? And so I think there's this whole like settling for what's been given. And it's like, I don't, I shouldn't have to settle and, and using I generally speaking here, um, black female characters shouldn't have to be like, oh, I need to be in a spinoff in order to be um, to be seen, um, because that may never happen. Mm. That may not even come to fruition. Um, and so why is it that they couldn't be in this action film? Is there a fear? Do you think it's not going to work? Do you not think it's going to sell? I mean, that got debunked with Black Panther. We see how long it took for that to come out because people thought, you know, Black superiors are not going to sell. And so I think um, there has to be, you know, this idea of stepping out of that bubble of what you think black women are capable of doing and presenting, you know, um, on the screen um, or even behind the screen as that goes. So I'm, a, I'm not wanting to say it needs to be, have the spinoff or have it separate, you know, might not have it all and, mm -hmm. you know, and let the kind of see where the chips go with that. Um, because right. you take chances on, on white actors all the time and nobody questions, you know, them. So, you know, yeah. why, um, these, you know, black characters more so black female characters have to be. Okay. Um, these are, I'm not sure if you hear that the background noise, but it is what it is in the neighborhood in which I live. So there's a great question from an anonymous attendee. And I know you, you've engaged some of this uh, at, at Berkeley and perhaps more, more recently, I'm not sure. Can you speak a bit about the representation or lack of representation of Black disability on television or in movies? 
especially in comparisons to comics. Yeah, so we were it, it's it's slow. It's slow and almost damn near non-existent. You know, the closest that I have seen um, regular consistent uh, of that, and um, there's definitely some on the independent side, but um, one where maybe many people have seen was when uh, Misty Knight um, mm -hmm. uh, was in the Luke Cage series and, and also the Defenders. And so where we see, where, you know, we see kind of like day-to-day -day struggles of this um, black woman who loses her arm and how she's treated differently by her coworkers. Um, and how she has to, I'm not even gonna say struggle, how she has to balance kind of a new normal or you know, how she has to operate in life. Not that it has to be this different operating, but more so like, this is who I am. And so this is the way that I um, will navigate um, going forward. And so uh, there definitely um, needs to be more and regular, and it's not that there is not this existence of it. And so that becomes the question of, well, are there, you know, there's no like disabled actors or, or if there are, you know, let's, we find someone and have them be disabled. And it's like, there's actually quite a few. So while you're having to create someone who is actually, you know, could fit the bill, um, but it's a matter of not being lazy and, and, and actually doing the research and doing the work. And so um, a lot of places are not willing to do that. Um, and don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, if they do, then they're also uh, seen in almost less than human ways. Um, and so then it's almost like, well, you're not even, you know, feeling the purpose of speaking to uh, disability. Um, you're seeing them as, you know, uh, um, you know, less than, um, the, you know, the, the crit theory, you know, that we see a lot where um, characters are just kind of like for fascination. They're for like, oh, look at that. And when these are people just like you or I, and so why must their stories um, be any different? They live in the same U.S. that I live in, and so why uh, should their script um, be any different? Um, a book that I would definitely uh, recommend um, that speaks a lot to particularly Black female um, disability is Body Body Minds Imagine by uh, Sammy Schlock, who is a professor at University of Wisconsin Madison, and so who um, it speaks to um, black disability and black feminism and disability, particularly in horror, also in speculative fiction. And so where I, I, where I do find it a lot in um, very meticulous ways is in like literature. I see it's, it's very well done there, but it hasn't quite translated um, onto the other popular mediums such as television and film. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Gibson. And thank you for that question. So I, I think we're we're about out of time here. I, I want to give you a chance to offer some some closing thoughts before I introduce our, our next um, session on our next lecture for next week. And I hate that we don't have more time because you know I really wanted to talk about Linda and Black Panther, and you know I wanted to resurrect the the very vigorous debate we had about the way in which Black Panther. Uh, celebrate some women, but not all women. Um, but maybe, maybe for another time. So, uh, Professor Gibson, any parting thoughts? Um, you know, just to kind of, you know, bring a little bit of that in. You know, so no show is also perfect. You know, by all means, do I claim that any of these shows, especially the one that I looked at today, are the the formula? Uh, but what they do get right, they do a lot of things right, and maybe there may be some things that they don't do right, and there are you know, many factors in which they do not. Um, but I think it's important to, you know, also focus on what is, you know, consistently happening. Um, and the fact that uh, this is a constant learning process. And if I'm, you know, looking back at shows that were horribly depicting Black folks, you know, I feel like we've definitely come up, you know, and we are definitely um, seeing a lot of changes and a lot of shifts uh, that we should be proud of. Um, and that we are, you know, examining the black experience in many diverse ways. And, and um, like I said, this is just the beginning. I can only imagine what is to come next. And so um, I look forward to, you know, what comes next and having the debates about, you know, what's <laughs> what could be better because mm -hmm. it's also about, you know, improving and, and making better as well too. So um, I see in the question, I wanted to um, re, um, 
give the name again, Body Minds Imagine, and the authors, uh, Sammy Shock and Sammy is spelled S-A-M-I, last name, S-C-H-A-U-L-K. That's it, thank you. Um, so thanks everyone for attending. I, I want to recognize uh, a few of my colleagues, um, Professor Williams from Georgia State University. Uh, is there someone named Kaniqua Robinson who is uh, part of our community as well? And our, my colleague and good friend, Leah Bascom, who is going to be the moderator for next week's session that I'll mention here before we close. Uh, next week, uh, we will hear from another graduate of our program who is now at Berkeley. Wait a minute, another Berkeley person. So you and and uh, Professor Gibson and Zaina and and Zaina will be introduced by another Berkeley grad, uh, Dr. Bascom. And so Zaina's title is Imag "Imaging Insurrection, Protest Photography, and the Visual Framing of Black Resistance." in the Black Lives Matter era. And again, that will be moderated by Dr. Bascom. Uh, phenomenal work by Dr., uh, but soon to be Dr. San Sanders, following your phenomenal work, Professor G, Dr. G, Professor Gibson. I wanna thank, again, Lakita Burnett Bailey. I wanna thank the Department of Africana Studies, all of my colleagues uh, who have supported this effort going on now for two years. And I want to offer a, a special thanks to the Auburn Avenue Research Library, again, for being not only a phenomenal partner, but such an important resource, not just in the city of Atlanta, not just in the nation, but internationally. I suggest that everyone follows Auburn Avenue Research Library, that you avail yourselves of all that they have to offer. And thank you, everyone. Uh, follow uh, Africana Studies on social media. We're going to be posting the calendar of events. And we appreciate you. Thank you again, everyone. Have a great evening.